All right, so welcome to those of you who are in Seattle in front of me. Uh, good morning. Welcome to people who are actually uh, virtual, who have logged in to watch the plenary. Um, we decided to try to have an in-person plenary this year, uh, but also stream out. And so we're happy to have people watching, but I would just like to mention that none of us up here are logged in. And so we've actually disabled the chat. And so we're just going to be able to take uh, questions uh, from the audience at the end of this. Um, but we're quite happy to be streaming this out for members who are not able to be here. All right. So um, welcome. Today, we have the 2020 STR plenary. As you know, the AOM conference theme this year is creating a better world together. And so for the 2022 STR plenary, uh, you know, we decided to try and incorporate this theme into what it is that we're discussing today. An important part of business strategy is creating, capturing, and sharing value. And so we decided that our theme would be creating a better world by creating value. So the agenda for today, uh, we have about an hour and a half together. Um, I'm going to start. I'm going to introduce each of our distinguished speakers. And I'm also going to provide an overview of some of the things that will be covered, but I'm not going into great depth. Um, and, you know, I could go on the entire session when I introduce each of our speakers. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do them justice. So I'm going to apologize to them in advance. Um, but we do have Meet the Scholar videos with uh, at least three, one coming, I'll explain that in a second, but at least three of the four distinguished speakers that we have. And I would encourage you to look at those on our STR um, homepage. All right. And then we are going to give each speaker up to 15 minutes. And we're planning on having enough time for Q&A. So we're looking forward to involving the audience um, in part of this plenary. All right, so we I'm thrilled to have uh, the speakers that we have today. Um, Bruce is en route. He is coming. Uh, he's a little bit delayed. Um, and so I will pretend like he's here. Uh, and I will talk about him as if he's here. And then he'll show up and it'll be seamless. Okay, so um, on our panel, we have right now, we have Connie, Connie Helfett, we have Phil Leslie, and we have Marvin Lieberman, and as I said, we will have um, Bruce. Uh, they're sitting in the order that they're actually going to speak, and so um, my slides, my introductory slides to introduce them uh, are in that order, so not alphabetical. All right, so first of all, Marvin Lieberman, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this. Marvin's a fantastic mentor. Uh, Marvin, uh, I have a personal relationship with Marvin because he was on my dissertation committee many years ago. Um, but I've talked to so many people who really also think that he's a fantastic mentor. Um, you know, Marvin is well recognized in our field. Um, you know, he's all of the academics are fellows of one sort or another. They've published well. Um, they're known for their research, um, they're thought leaders in different areas, uh, uh, different fields within strategic management. Uh, Marvin is currently at the Anderson School at UCLA. I think you've been there for 30 years, about. Um, and so he's also chair of the strategy area, uh, senior associate dean. Um, his research, some of the research that we're going to tap in today from him, uh, really is on you know value, creating value, capturing value. It's, it's a perfect theme, I think, in many ways for, for Marvin's work. All right, so again, not doing justice. Moving on, next up will be Phil Leslie. Um, Phil has a, has a very interesting background. Um, he was an academic at one point, and now he works at Amazon. Uh, as an academic, he has taught at UCLA. He's also taught at Stanford. Um, he has done, he's published in industrial organization, structural economic, uh, econometric models, information disclosure. Um, he's actually published uh, on a, lot, a number of different topics. Um, for our purposes, you know, Amazon is a very interesting company to be thinking about um, from both a value creation and value capture and a value sharing point of view, all three of those. Um, and we're excited that he's here to give us some insights into Amazon. Next up will be Connie. So Connie is at Dartmouth. Um, you know, I think a lot of us know Connie from her work at SMJ and we all appreciate all of her service and also mentoring on many academic topics uh, with many of us. And for purposes of this panel, um, you know, Connie's work on innovation in particular, dynamic capabilities, thinking about firms creating value 
Um, I think I'm, we're also excited to have her on the panel to talk about some of her work in that area. Um, Connie is also a fellow, uh, recently fellow at AOM, congratulations, uh, fellow at multiple places, um, you know, similar to, to Bruce and Marvin. I don't really think she needs a huge introduction, uh, but for people who, who aren't aware of her work, I just wanted to make sure that um, I have some information on all of them. All right, and last up, Bruce is going to sneak in. Um, I don't know, does Bruce sneak? I'm not sure Bruce sneaks. Um, Bruce is going to come in. Um, I understand at the uh, presidential uh, awards thing yesterday, there was very loud music uh, because we were right next to the room to introduce the president of AOM. And we are not going to do that here, but I feel like maybe we should have. Um, and then we could have had problems for everyone around us. Um, but so Bruce is at Columbia. Um, Bruce also has many publications. He's published um, widely on many different topics. Um, you know, I think Bruce has also chaired many dissertation committee. He's also a mentor, um, recognized by many. Um, Bruce's role on here is partially to think about social value, um, to sort of broaden us in, in terms of uh, how we think about value creation, value capture, value sharing. Okay, so as I said, I'm not doing justice to any of those people, um, but they will uh, do justice to themselves when you hear their remarks. All right, so before we start in, then kind of a broad overview of the topic. So value creation, right? So a classic topic within strategic management, the field of strategic management. Um, you know, sort of more traditionally, we probably think about a value-based perspective, focused on demand and supply, decreasing cost, increasing customer willingness to pay. Uh, we also have parts of our division that are that think very carefully about ecosystems and parties outside of a firm's value chain, how they impact value creation. We also have important parts of our division that think very carefully about stakeholders and how stakeholders may be more enfranchised when we think about value co-creation and when we really think carefully about value allocation. And so, you know, we hope that this topic kind of speaks to many different parts of our division and we hope to engage in an interesting conversation after you hear the remarks. Um, you know, personally, I think it's important to bring together different ideas, to listen to each other. Uh, we can learn from others and, and we can understand our own perspectives much better. So value creation, value capture. It's important to think about all of the different aspects that are impacted when firms are doing the activities that they do. And so we'll also think about, you know, our, our panelists will need to define their terms, think about what is value creation to them? What are they focused on? You know, think about who's capturing the value. Think about how we're sharing value. And so you know, employees, suppliers, partners, customers, competitors, government, local communities, broader global communities, right? All of this is certainly relevant. All right. So as I said, an important part of business strategy is creating, capturing and sharing, allocating value. So our distinguished speakers will cover different aspects of this theme. Mostly, they'll be thinking about big tech industry examples, not exclusively, but mostly. Um, we'll, you'll certainly see some thoughts on value added kind of real options thinking. You'll certainly see uh, Phil thinking about Amazon in particular, giving us some examples, you know, value creation inside and outside the firm. Um, you'll certainly see some thoughts on innovation and new business creation. And then um, you know, Bruce will come in and think about social value, defining and thinking different ways about social value. Um, and we'll hear about sort of challenges around incentives as well. All right, so that's the plan. Um, I am now going to hand it off. So as I said, each of the speakers have 15 minutes. So I will watch the time. Um, I will give you some indication of when your time is up. But um, at this point, we've got the 15 minutes for each speaker. All right, so Marvin Lieberman, welcome, thank you. Thank you, Heather, for organizing and for all the kind introductions. I'm going to talk about creating and capturing value at Amazon and other tech companies. I'll begin by asking, what is value creation and for whom? Then I'll talk about assessing the value added of the tech companies. And finally, I'll close with some discussion of real options thinking at Amazon. In some ways, my talk is an introduction for Phil's. In the strategy field, we talk all the time about creating and capturing value, but we're very seldom precise or quantitative about it. Why is that? 
Well, I think it's for a number of reasons. One is value creation is complicated, uh, especially if uh, we go beyond a narrow focus on shareholders. Uh, there are multiple ways to define value creation. And we know that most value ultimately flows to consumers, but measuring consumer surplus is very difficult. This extension to look at share stakeholders broadly is not just in our field, it's been embraced by the broader business community. We know that value is captured not only by shareholders, but also by employees, by suppliers, by customers. I think of these as the stakeholders who are inside the value chain. Value also goes to competitors. Now, competitors are not stakeholders, but they capture a lot of value. For many innovative firms, a lot of their value flows into the value chain of competitors through processes of imitation. In the strategy field, we do a lot of research on ways to prevent that kind of leakage. We've also got these other below the line stakeholders who are outside the value chain, principally government, local communities, broader society. And I'll come back to all of this, uh, especially when I talk about Amazon and about Facebook. And I think Bruce is gonna talk about some of the stakeholders at the bottom. In our courses, we say that value creation is created in two ways, by reducing costs and by increasing customer willingness to pay. And if you go beyond the narrow value chain, you have to recognize that there are spillovers to these other parties, a firm that, uh, cr that reduces costs but spews out enormous amounts of pollution in the process is not creating value for society. Now, let me ask you, um, exactly, is value creation about the reduction in cost and increase in willingness to pay? Or is value creation the differential between a given firm and its competitors? I think both of these are legitimate definitions of value creation. Part of the complexity we have is that we've got these multiple definitions. Where do we stand in the field today? I, I think that we've made a lot of progress by going beyond the narrow uh, shareholder focus to consider other stakeholders. I was at an excellent session on Saturday morning on stakeholders. I know there are a number of these here at the Academy, but I think we are still behind in recognizing the nuances and the time dimensions of value creation. In general, I would argue that our field has been very sloppy about the concept of value creation. Now, here's a, a, a diagram from one of my papers that shows you measures of value creation over different time horizons and different types of stakeholders. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that here. This is all in the paper. What I'm gonna do in this talk is draw from the important work of Brandenburger and Stewart to think about the value added of a company. And in particular, I'm gonna ask two questions. Question one, how much value would be lost if firm X disappeared overnight? And question two, how much value would be lost if firm X never existed at all? Now that second question is a really hard one to answer, but I think they're both very good questions. And I'll start not with a tech company, but with Southwest Airlines, where I've been able to, with my collaborators, to measure some of these things. I'll show you in a minute. And then I'll move on to look at the tech companies. So what about Southwest Airlines? I think most Americans know the Southwest was founded many decades ago in Texas, uh, flying only within Texas, very efficient carrier that when the airline industry was deregulated here, it expanded to grow throughout the entire United States. And this diagram shows you the value added of Southwest Airlines in 1980. Uh, the vertical scale here is the amount of resources needed to fly a passenger one mile. Uh, and what you see here is that in 1980, Southwest was about 20% more efficient than the other air carriers. But Southwest was also very small. So Southwest value added is that little slice. If you took Southwest out of the mix, other carriers would fly Southwest routes, but at much uh, lower levels of efficiency. So that's the value added of Southwest in 1980. If we go to 1990, all the airlines improved, but Southwest expanded by a whole lot. So their value added rectangle gets bigger. If we go to 2000, the same story, Southwest expanding, uh, having a higher value added. But by the time we get to 2010, the other airlines are catching up. 
And so even though Southwest is continuing to grow, its value added is, at least by our calculations, shrinking. So that's, that's what would be lost in any given year if Southwest you know, disappeared. If you think about question two, if Southwest never existed, what would we lose? Well, it would be the sum of all of those annual rectangles plus the value of innovations pioneered by Southwest that were adopted by other airlines. You'd have to find some way to incorporate that as well. So one thing to see from this graph is that value creation uh, depends a lot on efficiency and about scale. Uh, although I've been talking about Southwest Airlines, I think this efficiency and scale story also applies to Amazon. Although I can't draw you a graph like this, you can think in these terms about, about a lot of Amazon's businesses. So let's turn to the tech companies. Uh, this shows you their stock prices. Uh, no surprise, these firms have created lots of shareholder value. I'm not gonna talk about that. I like to focus initially at least on customer value, kind of a hard thing to assess, but we can do it through this thought experiment. You know, how much value would be lost if firm X disappeared? You'd have to move to your next best option. Uh, if we added, so you lose a little bit of value. If we added that up across the whole population, we get the total customer value of the company. And I, we've got these tech companies. I'm going to start by knocking out Amazon, and I'll knock out Google, I'll knock out Apple, and I'll knock out Facebook. So let's start with Amazon. Amazon's got lots of businesses. We have to think about this really business by business. I'm going to just talk about the top businesses you see there, the top three. Starting with the online retail business, the main business of Amazon. And this is a business where my family and I, if Amazon disappeared tomorrow, we would lose just an enormous amount of value. Um, I, I need a couple extra days a month just to go out and do all that shopping. Um, I know some people like shopping and so you're not getting the same kind of value, but I'm sure there are people in this room who feel the way I do. Um, and Amazon, you know, the, the alternatives are not as good um, and the competitors have trouble catching up, I think because Amazon has combined its digital capabilities with all this bricks and mortar, all those warehouses around this. It's really hard for competitors to replicate. So that's the retailing business, but they also have food retailing, which is different. And there, here there are lots of retail alternatives. In this business today, I think Amazon's value added is pretty incremental. But Amazon is aiming to transform the food shopping experience. And let me show you an Amazon fresh market, uh, not far from my home. Amazon is rolling these stores out across the country. I don't know how many people have been in them, uh, but take a look from the ceiling. You see all those cameras. Um, that's part of the secret of this. Um, it's remarkable. You, you go in the store, you grab a shopping cart, you throw a, a bag in the shopping cart, you grab things out of the bins, off the shelves, throw them in your bag. You take your bag, go out of the store, and within a few minutes, Amazon sends you an itemized, accurate list of what you bought. Um, it's, you know, I don't know if this is the future of grocery retailing, but it certainly earned a place uh, in my own repertoire of, of grocery shopping. What about Amazon Web Services? This is where Amazon today is making most of their money. Um, now, Connie's gonna talk about capabilities. Uh, and what I find interesting here is that most companies try to keep their capabilities that they develop in their businesses proprietary and as secret as possible. What Amazon does here is develop capabilities that it then rents out to others. And they've done this in web services. They've done it in other businesses, I think, Phil is going to talk about this. It's, it's you know, quite, quite amazing. Now in, in web services, Amazon's advantage, they had like a six year head start. The advantage is diminishing kind of like, a little bit like what we saw with Southwest, but, but their scale is massive. So I think they're gonna to continue to generate enormous value in these businesses uh, for a long time. Amazon's got other businesses. I know Phil's involved in some of these. I would argue that the value here is kind of incremental. There are other options out there. Amazon through Prime and bundling is able to add a little bit of extra value. Uh, but to me, I mean, the, the main value that I get is from that main retail business. What about the stakeholders of Amazon? Coming back to this slide. Well, uh, obviously shareholders have gained Customers have gained in part because Bezos has been so obsessively focused on the customer. Some could might say that Bezos has been too focused on customers at the expense of other shareholders. Uh, if we think about 
say employees, managerial employees have done pretty well. They're, many of them are our students. They're involved in team production. You know, they've been incentivized to work together, but Amazon has been criticized for not paying more to its hourly workers. Now, you know, wages are set by labor markets, assuming that there's no union. Um, how much above the market wage should Amazon pay? Um, I see these questions starting to be debated in the strategy field. I mean, economists have this concept of efficiency wages, which uh, Starbucks, another Seattle company, benefited, I think, from paying efficiency wages to their workers for many years. Uh, I'm not going to resolve this. It's, it's a really good question to ask. Um, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's certainly an issue to be to be considered. Suppliers generally uh, capture more value in partnership with Amazon than they do outside, but you know, some have complained about commoditization. You know, if we go below the line to the, these out of the value chain stakeholders, you know, government, well, Amazon and other tech companies have minimized their tax payments. We all know that. Amazon contributes to local communities, but you know, New York rejected that Amazon headquarters. So it's a, it's a mixed bag here for some of these stakeholders. Uh, competitors, of course, don't care for Amazon, but this is a standard story about, about innovation. Okay, let's think about Alphabet and Google. Now, if, if you go back in time and think about the early introduction of the Google search engine, it was a remarkable thing, created a lot of value. But I think today, Google is basically doing incremental innovation. Um, and because of the winner take all aspect of many digital markets, Google's able to do quite well financially, but I think their value added is, is pretty incremental. I mean, I could, uh, you know, move to other search engines or I could use Apple maps without losing a whole lot of, of value today. Now, if one of those moonshot businesses were to hit, the story would be completely different, but that hasn't happened yet. So I think compared to, in, in my view anyway, compared to Amazon, Google is, is a pretty incremental value added player. You could tell a similar story about Apple. Now, Connie's gonna talk a lot about Apple and you know, historically, if Apple had never existed, the world would be a very different place. Uh, but today, a lot of Apple's innovation is you know, relatively incremental. I could move back to Microsoft Windows and I could you know, ditch my iPhone for an Android phone, and I'd still be, you know, pretty much, be a little worse off, but not maybe that much. Um, so my own view is that Apple is creating more value than Google and Alphabet, but but arguably less than, than Amazon. Now, what about Facebook? What if Facebook disappeared tomorrow? Well, it'd be no major loss for me. Uh, some of you in the room might, might feel this a little more strongly than I do. I think other social networking companies would quickly come in and, and, and fill the gap. Um, the problem for Facebook is not with the, the stakeholders who are in the value chain. It's the stakeholders outside the value chain and those negative externalities. I mean, I don't think I need to talk about this. Anyone who's been reading the news you know, knows full well that these out of the value chain stakeholders, especially government and, and broader society um, have suffered arguably losses and whether those uh, partially or maybe even fully negate the inside the value chain value created by Facebook, I don't know, but it's, it's certainly a big negative uh, for Facebook. So back to Amazon. Um, I mean, Phil is here, Amazon's created huge value for customers in part because it's entered all of these new businesses. It's a mature company that's done all this great innovation. I'm, I'm really quite amazed. Um, uh, Connie, I think is gonna talk about innovation and there are lots of reasons why Amazon has been able to be so successful here. But one of them I think is that Bezos has promoted real options thinking very effectively within the company. Uh, those of you who teach real options know that there are three main types of real options. One is the option to delay, another is the option to grow, and the third is the option to abandon. And the first two, I think, are relatively intuitive, and most companies and managers understand this. If a project doesn't pay today, maybe we can wait and it would pay tomorrow. Uh, there are projects that don't pay, at, at least in the first round, but they lead to other things that would allow the firm to grow. I think everybody kind of gets this, it's intuitive. Um, but the option to abandon is really hard. It's about dealing with failure. It's about pulling the plug. 
Um, and, 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 and beyond that, it's about deciding which projects you want to pursue, uh, depending on whether you have that ability to pull the plug easily or not. And so um, Amazon and Bezos, um, through this metaphor, this brilliant metaphor of one-way and two-way doors, uh, has been able to keep the company innovative. Uh, Phil told me earlier today that he's got somebody every day uh, talking about one-way and two-way doors. Of course, two-way doors where the option to abandon a one-way door is where you don't. If Bezos had said, well, let's think about real options, let's think about the option to abandon, it would not have had nearly the impact within the company as this great metaphor um, of, of doors. And in, in, in work I have with with, with uh, Tim Folta and others, we argue that um, resource redeployment is the key to reopening the door. I'm out of time. Uh, let me just wrap up. I've talked about ways to assess value creation across multiple stakeholders. I suggested that you ask yourself, how much value would you lose if firm X disappeared overnight? And also, what is firm X's impact on other stakeholders, both inside and outside of the value chain? And finally, I've suggested that for customers and for many stakeholders, Amazon has created substantial value and Phil Leslie is here uh, to tell you more. Thanks everybody. Thanks for including me, Heather. I really appreciate it. It's um, fun for me to be able to come back and talk in front of a, a conference like this, to use PowerPoint slides again. I don't, don't know if many of you are aware that we don't use PowerPoint at Amazon. It's um, one of the things that's kind of stunning about the company. I remember when I first started, everything is about writing documents and, and sitting and reading silently. So we, like six times a day, I mean, one hour meetings where the first 20 minutes, we all sit silently and just read a document in front of us. And then we have discussion around it. And so don't get to use PowerPoint anymore. It's fun for me to come back. It reminds me of my days of teaching around, around doing that. Um, and also I have to say, thank you to Marvin. You know, everybody seems to have a connection to Marvin here in some form or another. And that's no less true for me. I've known Marvin since the late 1990s when I first worked at UCLA. And then I came back to UCLA after a stint at Stanford. And again, Marvin and I became colleagues in that case. We were in the same department at Anderson. I was there for four years before I joined Amazon, where I've now been for the last seven years. At Amazon, I lead a research team that focuses on our advertising businesses and our media and entertainment businesses. I'm one of four vice president economists at the company. There are three others. There's a vice president economist that leads a team in charge of AWS. There's a vice president economist that focuses on our consumer business and a lot on the logistics network. And there's also a vice president economist in human resources that focuses on those things. So I'm one of four, four vice president economists at the company. My area of focus is the digital businesses, which is our advertising and media and entertainment businesses. When I say that Amazon has become a big player in advertising, I'm still surprised how many people have not yet understood or figured that out. It's very public information. There's lots of articles written about this in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere. Advertising and AWS are our two biggest sources of free cash flow at the company today. And Amazon's the number three advertising company in the world behind Google and Facebook. We're also growing faster than either of those businesses are and make no mistake, our aspiration is to be the number one advertising company in the world. People go to Google to do searches and then Google monetizes those searches through advertising. People go to Facebook for social networking or to read the news, and then Facebook monetizes that traffic through advertising. And what we're starting to move towards at Amazon is that people come to Amazon for shopping. And while we get some degree of monetization from that shopping, we're also monetizing through showing ads. Here's an example of a search page. Here, all I did was type in golf hat at Amazon. I don't know if you can see everything on these search results that you're looking at right now are ads. This is the page of search results that come up. If you scroll down, there will be organic search results. But what you're seeing here, you can see little labels of sponsored written all over the place. And we have grown that business over the last five years, five to seven years. 
this was a business that only started for us about seven years ago. And at first we would have very few of these ads on the site and they've become so successful for us, so in demand from our sellers and vendors. And we've done a lot of research. My team has done a lot of research around measuring the impact of these ads on our customers. And we find that as long as we're setting a high bar for showing highly relevant ads, so that when you type in golf hat, we're showing ads for golf hats, although you can see there's one ad on here for sunglasses, which would be an interesting red flag for us. You know, that's the sort of thing where internally we would look at that and say, why did we do that? Does that make sense? Is that a problem? How common is that sort of issue? And those are exactly the sort of things that, that me and other teams at Amazon spend a lot of time worrying about because we want to grow an ads business which doesn't annoy our customers so that customers not only get value from those ads, but will also keep coming back and shopping at Amazon. So when I refer to ads, that's what we're mostly referring to is what we call sponsored products, which are these ads that you're seeing here. And this business has gone gangbusters for Amazon. And I would encourage you, if you're not already aware of it, to pay attention to the advertising aspects of, of Amazon's business performance. That's a big part of why the company is doing okay today. And um, it's an area that we'll continue growing in. And it's not just going to grow in terms of ads at Amazon, but ads that we'll be placing off-site at other places, ads that will appear in media and entertainment products as well. My team does a number of different things in relation to these ads, including the auction design and measuring the impact of these ads on customers. And we can talk more about that in, in Q&A. Half my team works on media and entertainment. This is quite distinct from the ads business, although they are starting to converge in interesting ways. Amazon has a bunch of media and entertainment businesses. We, we refer to it internally as GME, Global Media and Entertainment. And we also have aspirations to become a major global media and entertainment company. You know as well as I do today, we're number two, number three in many of these businesses. We have very strong competitors like Netflix or Spotify we're up against in this space. It's an intensely competitive space. Um, but we have Prime Video. We're about to come out with Lord of the Rings that's going to release in September. If, I hope that you guys are aware of that. We've been putting a humongous amount of effort into marketing and, and drawing attention to that as our biggest investment in content that we've ever done. Uh, we also have coming up this fall, we will have exclusive Thursday night football on Prime Video. We've had Thursday night football there, but it wasn't exclusive. It's going to be the only place where you can watch Thursday night football will be on Prime Video uh, starting this fall. So we're, we're excited about our video business. We're making big investments there, but it's also a place where there's a lot of, a lot of intense competition. Prime Video is a benefit for Prime members. So as a Prime member, you get to watch that for free, given that you've paid your Prime membership, which could either be an annual or a monthly membership. One of the things that my team specifically works on is figuring out how do those investments in Prime Video translate into incremental economic value for Amazon. Simply looking that people are watching the Prime video doesn't necessarily tell us how much economic value did that generate for the company. So we have a lot of economists at the company who are working on measuring what's the return on investment for Prime video and for Prime music and for other Prime benefits so that we're making smart decisions around that portfolio of investments for all of those Prime businesses. And that's a big part of the work that economists are doing in, on my team. We also have these other businesses. I don't know if you realize Audible is owned by Amazon. Twitch is owned by Amazon. We also own IMDB, which is a, a website many of you are familiar with, I'm sure, where you can go to and look up information about movies and films and other things of that sort. We have a gaming business as well. Our gaming business is still quite small, I would say, and it's an area where we need to do a lot of innovation for that to be able to grow today. It's a, it's a small, anemic business for us. I mentioned that ads and entertainment are converging. I'm sure you're all very well aware that there's been a lot of interesting news in the last few months around Netflix wanting to create an ad supported version of Netflix. You may also know that many other businesses out there are also following in the footsteps of Hulu that's been doing that for years, where at Hulu you have the choice of ad supported or ad free. Um, Disney is going to do the same thing. HBO is doing the same thing. Excuse me. It's, a, it's a, an extremely active area at the moment is figuring out the economics of ad supported versus ad free content. And right now all the tailwinds are around ad supported content. And that's why Netflix is aggressively going after that. For us, we have a streaming service called Freevee, 
previously it was called IMDB TV, but we rebranded it a few months ago. And Freevee is a completely free streaming service. There's no fee whatsoever. You don't have to be a Prime member. Anybody can watch Freevee. It's ad-supported streaming content. And this is a super important area for us to understand as a company that does advertising and as a company that does Prime Video and streaming video, figuring out how to create a highly innovative next generation form of ad supported uh, streaming is an extremely important area for us. And so we're making big investments in that space. We're trying to figure out what does it mean to provide highly relevant ads to customers in that experience? What types of content should we be providing there? And how do we think about jointly optimizing our ad, our ad supported service with Prime Video, we, we currently have completely separate content in those two services. And so it's, it's interesting for us to think about how do we decide which content to put in Prime Video and which content to put in Freevee. So those are some really active research areas. So my team is trying to figure out all that stuff. This is a really exciting area for us, ad supported streaming. I was trying to think about what would be some things I could talk about that we do at Amazon that you would find interesting and, and novel. And, and Marvin touched on a couple of these already. Um, one of the things that I think is not well understood about Amazon is the degree to which we have this mantra of we build something for ourselves and then we make it available to others. And it's become a little bit of a, of a playbook internally. If you can make a case for a big investment that looks like that, that we should do this thing because we need this capability for ourselves. And part of the payoff for this is that we will then be able to also make this available for third parties as well. And it's become, it's, it's, it's considered a desirable path for us because we have a track record in doing this in other instances. Um, I hope that you all know, and I think people often forget that when Amazon first started, it was a pure retail business, which is to say that Amazon purchased inventory from vendors. That inventory, which Amazon then owned, would sit in the Amazon fulfillment centers. And then Amazon would set a price and sell those items to customers through the Amazon website. Obviously, that started with books and then expanded to lots of other product categories at the same time. It was a huge strategic decision that was highly debated before I ever joined the company that they would then open up that retail business to third party sellers who could also list their items on the Amazon website to reach all of the customers who were coming for the retail business. You could have third party sellers listing their items. So in that case, of course, the third party sellers, they're the ones setting the price. They're the ones that own their inventory. Amazon is just a marketplace similar to eBay in that instance. But Amazon knew that that would be creating competition at the website for their own retail business, but that that competition would be beneficial to customers who would have access to many, many more products that they could buy through the Amazon website. So it was a very bold and difficult strategic choice for them, even to just go from having the retail business to the marketplace business. And this is what is often referred to today as a hybrid business. And sometimes we're criticized for this because there's a presumption that if we have a retail business and a third party marketplace business side by side, that that somehow creates conflicts in some ways. But of course, many of you I'm sure realize that most retailers do exactly the same thing. Walmart is doing the same thing. Many others are doing the same thing and we're not unique in that way. And it's something that Amazon has done for, for many, many years. On the retail side, we make margin based on the difference between the price we pay to the wholesaler and the price we charge to our customers, the classic sort of retail margin. On the third party marketplace or seller business, we charge typically a 15% margin on any items that sellers sell through our website. And a big part of the value for that is that these sellers get access to a volume of traffic. And so you need to understand that the typical story of a seller is, they don't necessarily think, gosh, I wanna pay 15% to Amazon. But what happens is when they sell their items through Amazon, they experience a mega jump in volume that they wouldn't otherwise get if they were selling through their own independent websites. So that's the decision that sellers face. And that over the years has worked out very favorably for sellers as we've had many, many sellers, of course, signing up to take advantage of that service. The second major big strategic choice the company made 
was to make the fulfillment centers available for these third parties as well. Of course, you're all familiar with Walmart and its distribution centers. At Amazon, we refer to them as fulfillment centers or FCs, it's just language. We invested in those FCs for our own retail business. And then a decision was made to allow third parties to store their items in our fulfillment centers. So our, today, all of our FCs are a combination of items that we own ourselves, our retail inventory, and items that we are storing for third party sellers. They're all side by side in our fulfillment centers. And of course we charge the sellers a fulfillment fee for providing that service. And then we arrange the delivery of those items to our customers. And part of the benefit of third party sellers listing in our, in our putting in our fulfillment centers is because we can now provide reliable one or two day delivery for our prime members those items become prime eligible items as well, which is a further boost in sales for those third party sellers. So this is a business we refer to as FBA, where we said to these sellers, we're allowing you to sell through our website. How would you also like to put your items in our fulfillment centers and we will arrange the fulfillment of those items as well. FBA, in case you don't realize it, was a gangbuster success. Over the last 10 years, sellers have loved using FBA. It has become a huge part of their business to the point that sellers will now say oftentimes that they feel like they have no choice. They have to do it. It's such, it's such an incredibly important part of what it means to sell through Amazon. Our perspective on it is that we built these fulfillment centers for our own needs, and now we're making them available for third parties to take advantage of as well. It's not mandatory. You can still sell through Amazon without putting your items in our fulfillment centers. You can use other fulfillment services if you want to, or you can build your own fulfillment services. But if you want to, you can use ours. They're competitively priced, and then you get access to Prime members through that. FBA, I think, is, is not well understood outside of Amazon. Internally, we understand that opening up the marketplace to third-party sellers was a significant bump in the trajectory of Amazon's business. FBA was a mega jump. That turned out to be a smash hit success with our sellers. And if you wanna understand the history of how Amazon got to be where it is today, it's really essential that you understand the role that FBA played in that. The third one, of course, is AWS. Marvin mentioned that. I think you're all familiar with that story. We built our own internal computing systems and then we made those available. AWS, as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, has had an enormous disruptive impact on IT all around the world. Now you don't have to have your own in-house IT systems. You can start a company like Uber or a company like Netflix with ever having, without, without ever having to own your own data infrastructure. You can just now outsource that to a company like Amazon or Microsoft or Google or others, and you can build these massive scaled tech businesses using the tech infrastructure that's being provided by companies like Amazon and AWS has just been an unbelievable success and we're very proud of it. And it's a, it's a huge big deal for the company. And as, as Marvin said, it's a place too where things are getting more and more competitive all the time as well, for sure. So this is a pattern that the company has established. I hope that we will continue this pattern going ahead, doing things in the, exactly the same vein. And that one day you might see a slide which has these three and three others on it as well as we continue innovating in this kind of way. Amazon has these leadership principles. How much time do I have? Two minutes. Oh, I'm done. Okay. I want to. I want to. Sorry. I apologize. I want to scooch to one quick thing, Ben, which is um, Amazon's leadership principles. Some of you may have heard of these. Um, I'm very aware that simply having a set of leadership principles, things on a wall, things on a website, there are 16 of them at the moment, um, may or may not mean anything internally. But I want to I, I want to want to vouch to you today that these things really do matter. These are totally public. You can type in Amazon leadership principles. You can read all about them. They have a lot of traction internally, and some of these leadership principles I've highlighted in in blue. Um, all of them are relevant. All of them are hardwired into our hiring processes, our promotion processes, and into, into the language that we use internally in terms of how we communicate with each other all the time. On the left-hand side, I've highlighted four of them, which I think are especially relevant to innovation. 
leadership principles around customer obsession, ownership, invent and simplify and think big. I don't have time to go through them now, but I think those all play a critical role in some of the innovation at the company. The last two on the right here, numbers 15 and 16, these are two leadership principles that were added relatively recently. These leadership principles are changing. There have been some that have been taken off and there have been some that have added. These two that have been added, 15 and 16 here, are relatively new. And I think we're still, I have to say, we're still coming to terms internally with what these mean and how we implement these leadership principles, what they mean as a practical matter. But I think that they're important for the discussion today Number 15 is about being the world's best employer. There's two areas where that's getting a lot of traction right now. One is around safety in fulfillment centers. That's a big push for us. It's a big area where we need to improve. The second is around diversity. And it's not just been in the last year. It's been for many years now that we've been pushing on diversity at the company. There's many different initiatives and ways in which we're getting traction around that. It's an ongoing effort for sure. And it's, it's going to be a challenge that we'll face going ahead. There's no question about that. On 16 here, about success and scale bring broad responsibility. The number one area where that's getting traction for us right now is around sustainability. And some of you may be familiar that Amazon has made some big commitments around sustainability goals. It is indeed an important and legitimate area internally. We have teams who are measuring carbon usage. We have teams that are developing carbon pricing internally. We have a lot of work going on in which we're truly committed to the idea of being a, an, an environmentally sustainable business. And there's a lot of effort around that. So that's the number one place where I think that's getting traction as well. I could talk for hours. I know I'm out of time. Thank you for listening to me. Amazing. Oh, the arrows. Okay. Right. First of all, let me thank Heather. I I don't know if I've ever been on a panel that has been so well organized. And so I, I want to thank Heather and my other panelists. Um, so part of that organization means that I'm going to sort of revisit and expand on what you've heard so far. Um, and I'm going to refrain from using Amazon as an example because you've had a wonderful presentation. As Marvin said during my talk, I'm going to talk about Apple because I know about a lot about Apple because I used to teach an entire course on Apple's strategy and its whole history. So I'd love to use that example, not because it's a tech company, but because I happen to know it pretty well. So with that, um, there we go. So I'm, I'm going to think about this from the lens of corporate strategy multi-business firms and the role of capabilities. I'm sure the latter will not shock you that that's what I'm gonna talk about. So um, having said that, um, I mean, this is a session on value, right? Creation and capture. So just some definitions, right? Um, so multi-business firms are no different than any other firm. When we think about value creation, it's the difference. I'm gonna use, um, you know, the Brandenburg and, um, uh, nail buff and Stewart definition of value, willingness to pay, which um, sort of obvious, and then lower costs where some kind of economy of scope in a multi-business firm is usually what we think of as one of the drivers of costs here. Um, and a lot of times that comes from sharing resources and capabilities across businesses. More recently, some of us have been working on um, what um, we could call resource and capability redeployment. I Kathy Eisenhart and I first called it intertemporal economies of scope, thinking about essentially sharing over time. Um, and then I have to thank uh, particularly Brian Wu and uh, Dan Leventhal for coming in and then Tim Falta and Arpati actually calling this resource redeployment, which I think is a much better term. Uh, and then um, thinking about it from a real options perspective and then some of Marvin's work. So. Um, you know, what this does is that says a lot about flexibility, right? So multi-business firms are not just about sort of getting costs down for economies of scope, but you also can have some flexibility built in. And I'm gonna argue that that helps you create value. Um, in what I just said, I said nothing about innovation, right? I mean, when people talk about multi-business firms, it's kind of like, 
all right, we have economies of scope over here and some other things. We have innovation over here and like, okay, they're completely different. No, they're not, right? So I'm gonna argue actually that um, in fact, we, we should think about these topics together. Um, so you can see I'm already picking up on some of what has been said before. Um, so I put up here the IBM, I found a great picture of the IBM developed these disk storage units, right? This was an IBM innovation. IBM is a multi-business firm at the time, right? They were in a, they were diversified, they were vertically integrated. Um, so I just wanted to give you an example. If we go through so many innovations, right? It's not just startups, right? So, um, you know, now I would argue that innovation creates value for society, okay? Uh, you know, look, look where we are today. Um, and um, it, it doesn't mean there aren't winners and losers, right? I mean, Schumpeterian competition, you know, is very basic. There are some winners and some losers when you do this. So, so I started thinking, well, just at a really basic level, what might enable multi-business firms to create value through innovation? What would be different about a multi-business firm that could do this? Um, and so, um, all right, so I, I've learned from Bruce, right, and others that, well, you know, one place where innovation comes from is is recombination of knowledge, resources, or capabilities. Um, you know, and it's especially effective within firms for a variety of reasons, right? Firms are, you know, have you know, there's social reasons inside of firms why innovation um, through recombination can be more effective, and other reasons. Um, and so, I would argue that by definition there's a potential in multi-business firms to recombine right, and innovate, um, you know, unless the knowledge and capability, unless you're a completely unrelated diversifier, right? There's a potential to recombine and part of the challenge is to take advantage of this. So um, how do multi-business firms recombine knowledge for innovation? So I just went through the literature and started thinking about, you know, okay, what do I know, right? Centralized R&D labs. This is the work of Nick Argerus and Brian Silverman you know, internal social networks, right? Going back to Bruce's work and uh, actually a, a beautiful follow-up paper with uh, Nick uh, Argerus and Luis Rios and Brian Silverman. Uh, redeployment of individuals across businesses, right? Um, so I have a recent paper on this, um, you know, where you shift people around, right? And they, they bring their knowledge with them and it's a route to adopting innovations and also creating them. Uh, corporate headquarters uh, groups do this, if they're active with it, um, it's old Gould and Campbell stuff. Uh, cross division teams, Kathy Eisenhart and Jeff Martin's work. So there are actually mechanisms for doing this. It's not kind of osmosis. So you do actually need to like manage this, um, but I do think there's the potential. And more to the point, you know, often innovation begets innovation, right? I mean, if you're in a multi-business firm and you have a strategy of recombination and you innovate, that's a platform for more innovation, right? So this is my favorite slide. I've actually used it for teaching. I dump it in a bunch of different presentations. So I apologize if you've seen this before, but I think here's a modern day example of how this works. So what I have along the top there are a bunch of different products, right? And so Apple is porting and recombining, right? From their original laptops, you know, well, piece, well, not PC, is the Max, right? You know, they've got different generations. They take the operating system into the MP3 player. They take their design capabilities, but they have to like learn new things in order to create this, right? They take what they learn in the MP3 player, put it into phones, but with phones, they have to actually combine that with new knowledge about actually, you know, how to have a communication device. Uh, and it goes on, we have tablets, we have watches. And then, you know, they're vertically integrated, right? So they, they're get using the stores to get out to their customers. Uh, so it gives them new knowledge, to, you know. They also, um, they do sell through their web store a long time. And then I've got all the compliments down on the bottom, right? So every time you innovate, you have more basis for recombination, right? Um, and uh, so here's an example. How do I think about this, right? So um, I, I'm gonna argue that this is not just about value creation. We shouldn't just think about Apple and the willingness to pay for Apple's products and the willingness to supply for Apple's products. This creates massive value beyond Apple, 
right? So think of all the complementers who have benefited, right? Well, you know, you know who, you know, think about all the competitors, right? Would we have all these Android phones? Well, it's an interesting thought experiment, but it's enormous amount of value created, not just by Apple itself, because of Apple's products, right? Particularly where they were innovators. I got cellular providers, right? How many ads do you see on TV? I think they're like the number one or two advertiser in the US. Why is that? Because of smartphones, right? Why is that? Well, let's try Apple, right? So this, this is one thing I think we should expand beyond thinking individual firms, right? Um, okay, so um, if we think about the value creation, right? You, you can't understand the story I just told you without thinking about the dynamics, right? Um, you know, you, you can't otherwise. So this goes a little bit back to Marvin's idea, right? Um, and it's not an isolated example. I, I think Phil has demonstrated that pretty well with Amazon. Um, um, and, and so, you know, and this goes to innovation, right? Innovation is by definition, it's dynamic, right? All this capability and knowledge recombination to use some of my early stuff, renewal, replication, redeployment, right? And, you know, just as a side note, where firms end up, kind of it's path dependent, depends where they started. Firms make choices, but you can trace Apple back, right? Um, okay, so having said that, what I wanna talk about is how I would think about the dynamic value of capabilities rather than thinking about them at a point in time, right? So, you know, this is where, you know, Marvin alluded to this, but I love this thought of the experiment. One of the reasons I started teaching the course on Apple is because I think it's such an interesting company because it, they almost went bankrupt, right? In 1997. So you can say, I mean, I would say at the time, like, so this is not hindsight, they had amazing capabilities. Right, the design capabilities in particular. They had, you know, the knowledge they built up in that operating system, how to integrate, you know, vertically to get these beautiful seamless products, right? So, you know, these had intrinsic value, right? So what if Apple had gone bankrupt, right? Um, all those capabilities and the knowledge, the organizational ones, right? I would argue a lot of that would have been lost. Now. Could another company have created as much value? We don't, we will never know the answer to that, right? But we do know that a lot of value would have been lost, right? And that's the dynamic value, right? Um, so if we keep with that thought, you know, you won't be surprised to hear me say that I think capabilities are engines of economic growth, right? Um, and so, you know, there, I'm gonna argue there is some value in preserving capabilities and knowledge that could serve as engines of growth. Um, and the value of firms remaining innovative, obviously. Um, we have lots of stories where firms don't um, manage to do this, but I think that we might want a priority on this. Um, and of course, if firms cease to innovate, then the capabilities will atrophy. So my last point here, actually I wanna explain because I showed this presentation to a, a couple friends to get the reactions. And the one thing they key on is this last point, right? So it says, and when firms die, capabilities are lost, right? So let me qualify this. You split up a company and you keep uh, organizational units intact, those organizational capabilities don't die, right? Um, and you also can have the capabilities of individuals. Company dies, but they disperse, right? So individuals have some capabilities that will keep going in another organization, but the organizational knowledge, if you have a multi-business firm and there's benefits to be them being combined, particularly for innovation, if they die, you will lose the part of the value that they add, the added value, right? And I think this is very important to think about that we can't just sort of willy-nilly like reorganize our economy, right? Um, so, so I think this is quite important when we think about, you know, what do we, what do we want to do in society, and what do we value? Because I think there's a there's a virtuous cycle, right, between innovate knowledge and innovation capabilities, and this leads to economic growth, right? Um, so, um, this is my last slide, and I think it's a, a lead into what Bruce is going to talk about. You know, like like most of us here, I've been spending a 
you know, probably an awful lot of probably most of my career thinking about value creation, right? Um, and I haven't said anything about like who wins and who loses here other than I mentioned the Schumpeterian competition, right? So what about value distribution, right? So I think anytime we think about that, we have to think about the entire complexity of what I was talking about, right? So if we just think about innovation, I think it's patently obvious that firms need some incentives to innovate. I mean, you know, there, there's a profit incentive here, right? This is why Amazon is doing this. Uh, I mean, not Apple is doing this, for example, right? Um, and this is why governments allow patents on innovations, right? For example, they give firms an incentive. So this is, this is old. Um, but I think the big question is how strong incentives do you need? Uh, and, um, you know, and what would placing limits on these incentives do to the value creation in the first place, right? Um, and these questions go well beyond the tech sector. I think actually an awful lot of the debate today is not simply tech, it's in, in pharma and biotech, right? Um, and we've even seen that with the COVID and the price of the vaccines, so um, particularly overseas. So I think that, uh, that these are big questions for to think about, and I think there are more issues of these kind of trade-offs that go beyond innovation, but um, I, I wanted to sort of bring together all these issues sort of around capabilities and innovation in, in multi-product firms. So thank you very much. So hello, uh, hello everyone. Hello. The, um, so I'll, I'll be close to uh, this uh, microphone. Um, and let me just make sure I have this. This is the clicker, I take it. Uh, or you can use the arrow. Yeah. OK. The, um, first, what a great panel of uh, people. And um, Phyllis talked about uh, small worlds, which is actually a term I'm, I'm, I'm close to, which is kind of a, a joke or a pun. Small was close to, but nevertheless, you know, the um, um, you know, so Connie and Heather and I were colleagues at one at one point. We all left that institution, uh, and uh, Marvin lives in Los Angeles, where I'm from, and often I looked him up and uh, and visited him. Uh, so it's and it's nice to see these colleges uh, which exist among uh, every every group, even in in big worlds like um, AOM. Um, I wanted to thank, um, uh, first of all, a, um, what, what did I have here? Panel creating, yes, uh, but don't brag about it. So that's, that's what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, so uh, thank you, Heather Berry, uh, PhD extraordinaire, uh, for all your inspiration, creativity, and Hollywood production skills uh, from, uh, from all of us. So, uh, and I, you know, with, with Louise, uh, Louise and other people, I've watched her put together these, um, these events and um, she's amazing and she gets, you know, she makes you feel good and you share things you never wanted to share with people and then you're embarrassed for a few months, but, uh, but it's all for the better. Um, it's all for the better. The, um, so I'm gonna, you know, I agree with Phil. I think that, you know, that's like the um, person who said, uh, I'm sorry for writing long letters because I didn't have, uh, um, what was it, uh, time to write a short one. Uh, so I'm sorry for using PowerPoint just because I didn't have time to think. I guess with what you were, you were telling us, and I'm I'm in the crowd, and I'm willing to kind of a little bit depart and say, you know, give you some uh, things which are I thought about while folks were uh, were talking, but I'll try to stay to script because we do have shortness of time, and we can talk about some of the stuff later. Um, so I can't really read these things very well, but I can't read in front of me. So I, um, so you know, I I've been working with a number of people over the years, um, and uh, one person was a guy named Nalin Kulatilaka, who's uh, many of you know his work, and maybe some of you know our work uh, together. And I see some faces uh, here have also worked with uh, uh, two. And Lee and I were uh, first year in MIT together. We um, had a lot of fun. Um, some of the people went off to uh, to Goldman Sachs and elsewhere, and they made a lot of money. Um, but we know stories in each one of them, which we uh, are paid to keep quiet. So these are deep friendships uh, along the way. 
and we did things a little bit differently. Uh, he's in the energy, still is in the energy, doing amazing things. And, uh, and he became, uh, from his energy expertise, he moved into the areas of, uh, of options. Um, if you were in MIT in that period of time, if you weren't in somehow getting, looking at finance very seriously, you really weren't, you know, you're missing your chance to understand something that became very, very, uh, very big. So um, then we began to work together on some stuff, which I want to tell you about which has to do with value. But my primary word, which I was keyed off on, um, was this thing of, it seemed like capabilities, of value creation for making better worlds or something like, uh, something like that. Um, so I, just, I want to stick a little bit to that last part, which we haven't talked about, uh, but guarantee we, couldn't, we can have a longer discussion about the whole, uh, the whole thing. Um, so, you know, so I'm going to avoid statements, you know, Strategy, strategy avoid statements about values like low wages with high executive compensation and shareholder capture. Not, I mean, we've all, we all put up, and I'll show you what we do in, uh, at Columbia, um, but it's not like the main thing we talk about. Uh, because one of the things which Marvin was showing us in this value creation uh, framework is that these are really, you know, the, the, it's uh, within game and outside of game. And you stay within game, which means you're not taking the general equilibrium of, a, of an economy. Uh, and that's really important to keep in mind, because then what can we say of any welfare uh, exactitude if we're not doing that? Um, but it's even more extreme than that, because you're really saying, I'm playing this game. So you may lead, lead out players, like you leave out things like the government. And most, I mean, a lot of people don't mind leaving out the government because they don't view them as value creators anyhow. Um, but you kind of know that they set taxes, taxes are set, and they're exogenous to the game. There's no game to be played. Instead, you focus on the ones which are, which are uh, you know, relevant to your strategy because you can't choose everything when you're when you're doing a strategy uh, design. It's very customer oriented. I think Phil expressed that, and I think was the first point you brought up. Uh, yet, yet views uh, you views that as independent as uh, as 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 inclusive of society. It's not well written, but I think you got the point. Um, it is confused over who should get credit for socially beneficial actions. This brings me to bragging. So case one, from a values perspective, what is a fair wage? So, you know, we all do the Walmart case or some version of the Walmart case, not as exciting as Apple, um, but I don't know, Connie, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said by, you know, uh, you know, hubs and spokes um, and you know, good, uh, good, good IT, you know, um, you, you don't have to ride a bicycle to, to get excited by that. Um, and they made a lot of money off it. Uh, and we saw how that was actually done over time. Um, and there's lots of additional evidence without arguing about, well, you know, what do you mean by low wage, you know, uh, that it paid low wages, uh, you know, and I would dare say, I would add, you know, relative to its profitability in places of low unionization. Uh, and this, this is primarily the South, but it's not entirely the South, what I'm talking about here. So we know these kinds of, of pictures, who employs people. Walmart is not minor because in, in the United States, it employs a lot of people. The data is a little old, but it still does a lot, lots of folks. Uh, Amazon is not on this, maybe because their fulfillment centers are still growing, uh, and I'm sure those numbers are increasing rapidly. Um, you know, it's the largest employer in Mexico, et cetera, and so on. So it's important. It's an important company. And then you have the wealthiest Americans. Um, I, I felt like one Walton dropped off, but you look up the Waltons. It's you know, uh, uh, you know, I have trouble with with billions. But I guess it's 150 billions on the uh, total among the Walton uh, family. So, I, you know, they didn't, and that's fine. I mean, who should, why do I have a right to criticize someone else's wealth given all the wealth creation they, they, uh, they innovated for us? Um, but part of me says, mm, you know, low, the sales wages are pretty low. And they've been down to Mississippi. You see those towns with nothing left inside the towns. You know, a lot of people will argue, say, well, yeah, that's where my mom shops for all this stuff and she can afford it for the family, et cetera, and so on. You get that, but at the same time, I mean, really, you could, you know, a uh, little higher wage maybe along the way. Um, and that's, that's, that seems to be over, you know, like argument, which is one now. And then you get to the issues of stock price, you know, performance, obviously, have done very well. Um, remarkable story. Um, we, uh, compared to high tech now, this is actually, it's a high tech company. Um, you know, they were a high, uh, a high performer. Um, so, you know, value and values is what the contrast is, I think, on, on that one. Because um, there's nothing in economics that says anything's wrong with that, right? There's nothing there. It doesn't feel particularly, particularly good. Um, and then you have, you know, the, the WTP, the, um, the ATP, and the uh, inclusiveness. Uh, so one is pharmaceutical industry and drug pricing as an example. Now, 
this is, I think, it's a little bit more to the point of what we're talking about today, is that you have this stick, which we all know, and I missed the illustration, I'm sure you put up the, the value uh, the value sticks, Let, yes or no. Um, you know, the various movies out there, and only some of them are, are, are pornographic, so you can go out safely, you know, uh, search, um, uh, search for them. Um, and you have WTP over price, uh, which is the critical uh, aspect, and then you have total value created, which is in, uh, in, uh, important of it. But what's interesting about this, I'm sure this was discussed, is that you know, there is, is value capture, which we didn't talk too much about earlier, but that's in part what we're alluding to here is value capture is a big part of this. And, uh, and you start off with, you know, in this new biform view of the world with, with the game like of entry, and then you get the core and you give out, you partition it out in uh, some way. When you actually solve it, you, you solve it from the, from the, from the back up for, uh, to the front. So you get the, uh, so you work with, you know, if you were given this strategy, what would this core be actually be doing and then, and then move it, uh, and move it back. So all of us who like dynamic programming kind of get um, interested in that, even if it's over one, you know, one, one period. A, this ATP, which I spoke earlier, the ability to pay is, is lost. Because this is something which we never, I rarely hear mentioned in strategy classes. There's a willingness to pay, and there is also a, uh, an, uh, an ability to pay. So everyone who cannot pay is not part of the game. You know, and technically that's what it means. And I'm sure Adam and, and Gus Stewart, who are wonderful, wonderful people, would, would have something to say about that. But technically, they're outside of the game, and that's uh, and uh, the, the analysis do would be outside of the of the uh, of the conventional welfare uh, test. Um, so, so what happened more simply? So, one one example is the solar opportunity increase my W uh, my, my my willingness to pay. So, I, I wanted what's called SREX things. So, I I have I put solar on, on my roof. I, um, and then later on, I get a check because there's a, a intermediator who sells that solar uh, to companies which overshot their quotas set up by a regulator in the government. So it's a pretty typical uh, way of doing that. But so can, can I brag? Well, you can bet I bragged a lot to all my friends, uh, particularly those people who teach you know, energy sustainability and have yet to put solar on their roofs yet, um, um, that, um, uh, that I do that. But I really don't have the right to brag because I sold that, so I got paid for that, you know? So what am I bragging about? That I put on solar and then got paid back for it, so I broke even, or, uh, so how greedy can you be? You wanna be both, you know, breaking even and at the same time wearing, you know, Gucci shoes. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a way to think about that, but as part of the conversation is, you know, is, is in this ESG world that there's a social value, which is in addition to uh, what the actual economic value is, um, and people still want both uh, of both of these pies. I want to say one last thing about uh, options on this. Um, so, um, so this is the option stuff which we did on it. And I don't know if Marvin actually knows what we did on it, so I want to make sure he does. Um, so, um, you know, we did stuff looking at um, options with growth, weight, exit options, and value uh, uh, creation. And we did it formally a formal model. We did it through simulation. And there's been a bunch of empirical work done as well, including uh, Tim Fulton. Um, so, you know, the idea is that the option gives you gives you a capability to take an action. If you didn't you didn't make that investment, you couldn't do it later on, um, or otherwise you would not be able to exploit it. And abandon. I don't know why it's so difficult. There's simply a put option. You just run everything in the other in the other in the other direction. But maybe cognitively, he meant it's a difficult thing to to do. Uh, two countries, plants and plants in both countries, one each. Um, you, have flex, you have fluctuations in, uh, in exchange rates, which makes it valuable to move, uh, to move back and forth. Um, you have something which I love this chart. Um, if, if you don't know the word hysteresis, I recommend you look it up. It explains a lot of the reasons why people don't take actions and firms may not rationally take act, uh, actions, such as Kodak versus, you know, Fuji. Uh, uh, but you have exchange rates going up and down. You got a little band of, 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 of inaction. Um, when the when AWS eventually stops paying uh, high profits, Phil's going to have a choice to make whether or not to sell. Maybe that's a fluctuation, or he actually go, uh, uh, or uh, or he waits he waits a little bit longer. Um, so you value that as well, and then you work out this option thing, which means that you have the export one. This comes up in the paper with Sue Young, uh, which we used in SMJ, uh, but you gives you this options gives you. A you know a uh, option uh, uh, the uh, higher profits and parts of that no, uh, initial line 
where you were, uh, where you, you, bought, you had to stick to it because you, you didn't have any, have any flexibility. So that's the value of options. It seems great and beautiful and, and, and fantastic. Now, um, so then two plants provide the options where I just said to you now, there's no capability and the volatility uh, has only a, uh, without the plant, there's no capability and the volatility has only a downside, you're stuck. But with it, you actually can, can, uh, you can uh, uh, respond. Uh, I've talked to firms about this. They don't like these ideas, by the way, because you just optimize their plans and they don't want to be told they have to have excess capacity. Um, so where did the value come from? And this is the thing I missed. I mean, I missed this, you know? So I went up, I got invited to a fancy, fancy conference, you know, with really good uh, food. I was a pretty young uh, person at the time. Uh, it's in my, my mid, mid 30s and it was the best meal I ever had in my life. I didn't know you raised covers off, off food plates before. And it was just great. Those Europeans are incredible. Uh, so, um, and then we, I didn't know, that, and, and then we give this talk and there were people from the unions in the, in the thing. The guy raises his hand and says, well, where does the value come from? He basically asks and says, you know, it must be from firing workers. And I go, oh yeah, something like, like that, you know, uh, because you're moving, you're moving production back and forth. Eventually I, I thought, I said, well, it must be excess, you know, um, uh, you know capacity and they're, and they're just overtime pay back. I just guessed just to get out of that particular situation. But I was very, very embarrassed to be putting up uh, that particular uh, idea and not realizing that for some people in this partial equilibrium game who are outside of the game, we're taking a very serious loss uh, by, the, uh, by what I put, uh, I put in front of me. I hope you understand what I just said. Um, the game has made it look good. But outside the game, there were people, not, not included, who, who, whose lives were in, uh, threatened by what I was uh, suggesting. Uh, economically, I thought it was great. I loved the math, but I was a total jerk by, by doing that. So uh, lesson, uh, lesson learned. So that's the conclusion um, that value creation and value, uh, value uh, uh, um, creation and creation. So I was kind of rushing here. I'm not welfare estimates. Um, so it's not, it's not generally uh, equilibrium values and value. Uh, and why do so many people brag about the contribution of social good when they are paid for it? Why do so many people brag about their contributions to social good when they are paid for it? Um, and creating value is important, being paid for it's part of the game by which dynamic economies operate and sometimes social good is often uh, created. But just don't brag about it, like me, when you're paid for doing it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So I wanna give the speakers an opportunity if they have any reactions to each other. Um, we have about 12 minutes left and I definitely wanna have time for Q and A, but do we have any reactions to each other? I'll take that as a no. Okay, so um, we've got a mic that's set up, a standing mic. We've also got Michael Liveline, who's gonna have a roving mic and he's happy to come back to you if you prefer to stay where you are. Um, so in terms of uh, questions, do we have any questions from the audience for our panel? We've given, been given a lot to think about. Wow, we're a very quiet audience today. Oh, excellent, All right, good question. Hi everyone. So my name is Marius and I would have a question basically to, to Amazon and the value. Um, quite a concrete question. If you look at AWS as a service, Amazon knows the revenues, but the question is, are you already measuring the value you're generating for the customers? So let's say, I don't know, um, IBM is using AWS or whatever they have. Do you know how much value they have and how did you start measuring this already? All right, so if you can repeat the question that, as you understood it before you answer it, I think that'd be useful. Yeah, I was, I was gonna do that because I'm not sure I did understand yeah. the question. Yep. <laughs> I think your question was, do we measure the value that we provide for our customers of AWS? Exactly. Yep. Um, I, I don't know firsthand, I don't specialize in AWS related work. If I had to guess, I would say that we have teams that are working on pricing models in there on demand 
estimating demand models in which implicit in that work would be how much value are you providing to your customers? But I'm not familiar enough with the details to be able to tell you any more than that, I'm sorry. All right, thank you. Do we have other questions? I see one right there. So given we think about this, that all the other stakeholders, right? So we have consumers, we started off with that list. So I'm curious about who's measuring the value piece, that metric, that that portion of the stick, if you will, that goes to those other stakeholders, right? So we can get what the consumer surplus is. But I'm wondering if, if any of the panelists want to comment on having seen organizations do this piece, right, and do it carefully. I mean, I think we, you know, sort of carbon footprint and that kind of thing, but in terms of whether it's you know, anybody in that audience, that other list, so we, what what kind of measures are, are being used to say to capture that that social? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's part of the challenge. I mean, I I argue that the I mean, you know, the value stick is entirely within the value ch chain as we've defined it in the field, um, and then there are these what economists call externalities, uh, which are kind of hard to characterize. Um, you know, like I, I ended with with Facebook. I mean, these externalities are, you know, it's one thing to quantify AWS. It's another to try to quantify, you know, the harms allegedly that are committed by by Facebook. So I, I, th I think we've got a lot of, of challenges there. I, I back to my earlier comments. I think part of the problem we have as a field is that we've been focused on within the value chain or what what Bruce called, you know, within the game. You know, the and and really thinking about the outside the game outside the value chain stakeholders is really what's 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 key here um and so as, as you say finding out figuring out ways to quantify those or even to characterize them more effectively i think is important for the, for the field it, you know if not um you know for for firms but but if we want to you know contribute to to the public good public policy um, and I think there's, there's a lot of impetus to try to get the academy to, to do that. Uh, I, I might comment, actually, Bruce brought up some really interesting points. I mean, Bruce was one of the very early um, contributors to real options. And I, I still think that real options, uh, 25 years after Bruce's contributions, has not taken off. Uh, in the field to the extent that I think it should is that you know the value of flexibility and and one very interesting point that Bruce raised is that he didn't think through those you know those effects just by you know flexibility is great but flexibility means that some people may be getting hurt um, so so I, I do think that expanding on real options in in terms of stakeholders in terms of terminology, as I said, you know, if, if we could call them doors instead of options or something, maybe we'd be better off. I think a lot of people, even in our field, don't really understand real options, which is, in my view, one of the most powerful tools that we have. Thanks, uh, thanks Marvin. Um, so can you hear me? So yeah, you have to be close to the mic for the virtual folks here. Can you hear me now? So um, the, um, anyhow, the option to, to have the options become better known and remain open. So, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, some hope, some hope in that. The, um, but there were a lot of people who did that, uh, obviously. Um, you know, I want the Amazon story. I, I use Amazon. I just got my list of things. I, I realize I'm paying for my Kindle, my Kindle as well. I, uh, so I, there's one company called Scrib, S-C-R-I-B-D. You ever heard of that company? They're just stealing my, there's no way to shut them down. At least Amazon, you can pull out and stuff and good. So I, you know, thank you for that. You know, for having our option to abandon uh, paying, uh, but I don't because Kindle's a great service. So, uh, and that seems so what, what's so wonderful about Amazon, so frustrating, is that we've got us at our close to our willingness to pay it still sometimes. It's like Delta. Delta is such an optimized airline, but, you know, but I hate it because you know, like you can't get enough points to go sit in the lounge. You know, they know exactly what they're what they're doing for you. Um, so I was thinking about these issues on how AWS fits into this. Um, and, uh, and I was wondering whether or not, you know, uh, like Von Hippel, I'm not sure you've ever heard of him, um, Phil, was a guy who said, learn from users. He had like skateboarders and, 
that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you had learning from inside labs, et cetera. You sound like Amazon is more of a lab learning company. Um, is that is that right? I mean, you do observe what customers are doing their choices. So it's not like you're learning larger principles from that. Uh, or maybe the AI is doing patterns, but it's not really what I'm talking about in terms of you know learning about innovations or so I thought maybe you can you can give us some clue on how that's done. Bruce, do you mean learning about innovations, like sharing of knowledge inside of the company, or where do the inspiration for these ideas come from? From More our customers, ladder. from our data. More the latter. Where do you where do you get it from? Yeah, um, you know, with all the data that we have, there's still a surprising amount of emphasis on um, on anecdotes, actually, and. Um, You'd be surprised how often I, I haven't experienced this yet with our new CEO Andy Jassy, but um, Bezos was famous. You could all, anybody could send an email to Jeff at Amazon.com, and and so he would get these these customers complaining about something or other, and then he would simply forward that email to the relevant business leader inside of the company, and all he would include was just a simple question mark, and so you'd get the Jeff Bezos question mark email, and then that would set off an enormous amount of work by the relevant team to figure out what had gone on here. And it always struck me as so fascinating. It's such a big company with so much data. And as an empirical researcher myself, the kind, my, my approach, just speaking from my own point of view, is to, to diminish the value of an anecdote and to always focus on the data, which gives me a much more unbiased, more complete picture of things. And we would do so, these teams would do so much work in response to this one customer complaint. And there are millions and millions of customers at the company and that one customer would trigger that. And then that might ultimately lead to something very innovative as well as people try to figure out how to respond to that. And so, I, you know, I don't think there's a simple answer to your question, but it is surprising to me how much customer anecdotes drive innovation at the company. It's a big part of what happens actually. <laughs> The recombination? Yeah, cross fertilization. Across businesses? Amazon's a, um, Amazon's like a very, um, it's a big diverse company, obviously. We, we're in many, many different businesses today, as, as I'm sure you all know. And, and a lot of the diversification is vertical diversification through the value chain of, of, of shopping and retail all the way through to manufacturing now, but all through logistics and all of those things. But we also have some horizontal diversification as well. Um, the company operates with a tremendous amount of decentralization. Um, I, I'll never forget an engineer who had worked for Amazon and then gone and worked for Google and then came back to Amazon. He said to me, at Google, any time that there's a problem that they're working on, it's like the Royal Navy. They're in lockstep. They're incredibly well coordinated as they go after a problem. It's a very well directed, very precise almost effort to, to solve a problem. Whereas at Amazon, everything is chaotic. It's like a band of, of it's like many different pirate ships fighting each other and going after the same the same gold or whatever it is that they're going after. And you definitely feel that when you join Amazon, it's a company that is highly chaotic. Um, there's a lot of duplication of effort across teams, a lot of teams working on the same things, sometimes sharing information with each other, sometimes not, sometimes in competition with each other. And it can be very frustrating for people. Um, my, what I have said, and I don't know if this is correct or not, what I have said to people who struggle with that, I say, the day that we try to eliminate chaos at Amazon is the day that we also will be stifling innovation. And one of the things I learned from the literature on corporate innovation is that there's a certain amount of chaos and waste and failure that's essential to being an innovative company. And so I'd like to think that part of what's helped Amazon to be so innovative over the years is that chaos. There's not I don't think consistent patterns of learning or sharing knowledge or coordinating together in different ways. And people often feel frustrated by that and want more of that inside of the company. Um, I don't know if what we're doing is correct, but I do see some upside in that chaos and getting comfortable with that chaos and realizing that that's a license for you to go and explore and try new things without having to check if there are other people at the company who have already solved this or who are already working on this like you feel empowered to go and work on things and then 
at some point you might learn that there's another team somewhere in the company that's already solved that or had or had key learnings around that and that's just part of what it means to be in a innovative chaotic environment i hope that answers your question no okay so thank you very much so now it is the top of the hour and so we're gonna end here but i want to just give a big round of applause for all of our distinguished students All right, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day of the conference. Thank you so much.